Welcome to Revive Me See Podcast. June is Post Traumatic Stress Disorder Awareness Month. 12 million people in the United States li- are living with PTSD, and most of them don't get the help that they need. We are nearing the end of this month as we pay, pay tribute, and I want to introduce a new guest. Her name is Kimberly Berlin. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insight with us today. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, Robert. It's a real pleasure. Thank you for having me. I always like to start off with a disclaimer. If you are in the States, 988 is the suicide crisis lifeline. If, but wherever you are, whatever neck of the woods, I always find, uh, encourage people to find what resources help. I don't like reinventing the wheel. So, um, you know, communities help com- each other. So whatever that is, whether it's a church member, uh, clergy, or it's just a group, a support group, whatever that is, I do encourage you to find help when you need it. The three hardest words to say is I need help, especially nowadays. But I want to start off because people say better than me. Kimberly, I'm not, I'm not saying, I know, I know there's a lot of great quotes out there. One is that this, the first one we're starting off is someone I don't, it's unknown, but I love what it says. It says it's, it isn't about what's wrong with you. It's about what happened to you. What comes to mind when you hear this quote? It's a beautiful quote. I wish I knew what, who the author was. Um, um, but well, first of all, it's absolutely true, you know, um, because we often look at mental health. Oh, there's something wrong with you, right? As a negative, um, not that um, something must have happened to you to have something occur that would be reflected in your mental health, right? Mm-hmm. So. Um, you know, trauma creates a, a real systemic um, and systematic chain reaction, and it affects our entire being, our whole experience in our life. And, um, you know, it's considered, trauma is considered the disease of despair mm-hmm. because there just is that sense of it's hopeless, nothing is going to work, right? Nothing is working. I can't find any help or I can't get help. Mm -hmm. Um, But really, it's what's happening inside us where the damage has taken place. Mm -hmm. And so I like to think of um, PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder not as a stress disease, Mm -hmm. but as an opportunity for spiritual discovery. Mm -hmm. And it's a different lens, right? It's a different way to look at it. Because healing begins when we tap into that capacity to know that something else is true, right? Mm. Yes, we feel pain. Yes, it's unimaginable what we've gone through, but there's something else. Mm -hmm. Um, And that harkens to, uh, you know, the writings of Viktor Frankl, for instance, who Mm. was a Holocaust survivor, Mm. um, and so many other philosophers and and, um, uh, theorists, etc. But when we experience an adverse event, our brain registers it. There's no question about that. And then we have this immediate response of increased blood pressure, heart mm-hmm. rate, sweat, the whole thing, right? Mm-hmm. And breath is, you know, we get out of breath. Um, and then we have the psychological reaction. So mm-hmm. either our mind freezes in terror, right? Mm-hmm. Stays there, mm-hmm. or it goes into a shock from which we can't emerge. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And there's a beautiful quote from Gabor Maté, who's a well-known um, uh, doctor. Uh, he's a psychiatrist, um, addiction specialist, but ultimately a trauma specialist. Mm-hmm. And he says that trauma is not what happens to you. It's what happens inside you as a result of what happened to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, I think that that is a really hits the nail on the head. Um, and it speaks with, to why so many people can witness the same horrifying event mm-hmm. that each person takes it on differently. Yeah. You know, so like 9-11 is a really good example mm. um, where we have this catastrophic, catastrophic event that happened and was witnessed by not only the entire nation of this country, but the world. Yeah. And in that one moment, every single one of us took on the trauma of that event. Yeah. But it was how we processed it in the days and weeks that followed Mm -hmm. that relied on our capacity to process what we saw Mm -hmm. and then draw forth from our internal resources. So some became very loving towards each other, right? We've had Mm -hmm. this outpouring of, oh my God, connect human connection. Mm 
Mm. Um, but then we also have this outpouring of rage and anger and, you know, get them, right? Mm. Get, get them. Yeah. Uh. But, you know, and unfortunately, sadly, slowly that love and immense compassionate capacity that we had as a nation dissipated. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that trauma can really lock us inside as a protective mechanism mm -hmm. and it can shield us from not only learning from the experience, but also it can prevent us from having any other experience mm -hmm. um, so that we, you know, can't, so that we won't relive anything in our consciousness. The irony is it will keep going in our mind like a hamster wheel, mm -hmm. right? And that's where we struggle with trauma. Mm -hmm. So in, in my practice as a psychotherapist, um, uh, we have, my belief is that we have a, a primal internal resource mm -hmm. and it is our connection to that internal sense of who we are and our own knowing, mm -hmm. despite all of the challenges that we might have. And we call that the self mm -hmm. capital S. <laughs> so that is the seed of our consciousness. It's where we are centered. It's in our heart. It's clear. It's compassionate. It's connected. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, some call it. Um, uh, so in, in Buddhism, it is the, the Buddha within, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in Christianity, the, the Christ consciousness within, right? Mm -hmm. Many, many, many names for this place that resides in that sort of heart center. Mm. Where we feel, we love, we open, we're vulnerable, we accept. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, if our if if we tap into that spiritual connection, that energy, that place within us is what can save us from the devastating effects of trauma. Yeah. So, and I want to clarify that spiritual, not necessarily religious, although you can be spiritual and religious, mm -hmm. religious and spiritual, but you don't have to be religious if you yes. do All right. Um, so when we connect to that self, right, mm -hmm. that is where there's hope mm -hmm. and that is where there's meaning. Mm -hmm. And I think that is why for me and working with my clients, um, I try to help a, put the, on a different lens, put on a different set of glasses so mm -hmm. that we just see it differently. Ah, oh, yes, this was a horrible thing that happened. It was devastating. It's affected my whole life. Mm. I want to now be able to heal from it. And so that healing process is, well, let's first connect to this in inside. And mm. then from here, start to really un undo the damage and heal from within and that means also that we pull from without as yeah. Well, right yeah, yeah. and right. i feel like um you know there's a quote from jake wood that actually it's haunting especially when you're talking as you are when you're talking about the self he says it so kind of so simplistically but so just it just hits that nail nail mm -hmm. because it's I feel no emotional connection with the outwardly human gestures. That makes sense if I'm not here. I'm in Afghanistan, you know. So you know, you could be, and I, you know, when it comes to veterans coming back with post-traumatic stress, I'm a veteran myself. I was, I served during 9/11, so I know when it comes to um, being, you know, when listen to Jake Woods. Uh, feeling of how he goes through this outward it's just at least it feels like there's some acceptance of what he's feeling he's like i i'm going through little emotions tell him everyone's saying you know you're great you're home you're yeah. doing well and he's not <laughs> he's, he's no. somewhere else <laughs> you know so Truly. what are your thoughts when you hear this quote Boy, um, I mean, it really impacts me. Um, my husband served in Afghanistan. Um, I, you know, um, I, I, I've worked with veterans and, yeah. and it is so true. There is that, there is that experience of mm. never having left. And again, yeah. back to that, you know, fight, flight, freeze. Yeah. So many just freeze, mm. right? Um, and. And there's a whole sort of neurological, biological reason, um, but in, in but there's also a spiritual reason too. 
um, because in, in so many of these situations, um, and particularly in the kind of wars we fight today, so mm -hmm. addressing veteran, the veterans and yourself, and thank you for your service, by the way. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there are not enough resources in the field. In, yeah. There's not enough resources and, you know, uh, there's not enough time or it's not appropriate to attend to that. And mm. we understand that. Okay, that's fine. Mm. But there should be a lot of debriefing before they come home and yeah. perhaps that, right? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, that's how I sort of, you know, respect, like it, it does, it hits home, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like you know, on the other side of the spectrum, there's people who experience trauma, you in their regular life, you know, in the day to day. So the problem I've, at least I work in the mental health field too. And I, what I realize is that, um, people kind of measuring, there's this measuring stiff of how bad their life is or what they're going through and they don't get no help. They mm -hmm. don't because they're like, well, I'm not as bad as this. And you've seen it in support groups. And I feel sometimes that could be, um, sometimes a bit barrier that you wouldn't think it would be one when it comes to actually getting help when it comes to trauma. Right. Yeah, because um, you're comparing out. Yeah, you're not comparing yeah. in, right? Mm. And you know, comparing out just isolates us further. Yeah, I'm well, not that bad. You know, I'm mm. not as bad as he is or she is. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, our relationships are turned upside down. We're drinking too much. We're doing drugs to numb out, or mm. we're on the social media, you know, hours and hours a day just to lose ourselves, to mm. numb out, right? Mm. Yeah. And, you know, or worse in my, in, in, I mean, no. I can't think of anything worse is just to grit your teeth and force your life through it, you know, but the yeah. you can't do that. You can't, you can't force, you can't grit and force. You can't, <laughs> yeah. what happens is you lose your teeth, you know, <laughs> <laughs> sheer willpower is not going to make the effect stop. Yeah. And so that doesn't work, you know, and all yeah. this drugs and, and excessive alcohol, that, you know, and then finally doing nothing doesn't work. Yeah. Right? Um, so there's, there's that sort of barrier of ego sometimes that comes mm. in, right? Oh mm -hmm. no, I'm fine. Everything's mm. fine. I'm, mm. you know, I'm, I'm insecure, neurotic and, uh, you know, emotional, but I'm fine. And, yeah. um, but it, when we, when we are in, in trauma, no matter mm. how it's landed within us, mm -hmm really we have to connect we mm -hmm. have to start with that connection we have to start with going to that place within us mm -hmm. where you know the ultimate truth resides i need help yeah. you said it at the very beginning the most mm -hmm. difficult words to, to utter in the human uh -huh. language right i need yeah. three words right yeah so yeah um yeah so doing nothing it doesn't work mm -hmm. um and and, and I think although someone else's experience might be worse, mm -hmm. we can learn from it. Yeah. And someone else's experience might be less, mm -hmm. we can learn from it. Right? Because, uh, yeah. Because we can then lend our experience, strength, and hope to that individual who hasn't experienced the level of trauma that we have, but we know their pain. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and I feel like, you know, that, you know, reframing of how we see things when we look at, but also, uh, I, you know, when it comes to, you know, the person like canceling them, oh, someone's worse than me. I'm like, when is there ever time for you, whoever the person would be? Yeah. When is the time for um, Josh? When is it time for you? When do you have time? Because a lot of times they're saving the world, helping everyone else, but yeah. not themselves. Yeah. And um, I find that it seems like it doesn't make sense but it does when you're helping people you're not you know, it doesn't make you see the hardest or have the hardest conversation which is conversation with yourself when seeing yourself in the mirror not looking always just outwardly i, I find that sometimes and leading into that i want to ask you yeah when you think of trauma what have you experienced or seen help those suffering and what has not helped as much because we're talking about different aspects different situations but I want to hear from you. What What do you think has helped? What have you seen in your profession? Sure. Well, you know, I've just um, uh, mentioned a few of the things that don't help, um, which mm -hmm. is, you know, um, uh, comparing out doesn't help. Doing nothing doesn't help. Um, but here's some, let, let me go into what does help. 
All right. Um, and I think that, um, uh, you know, starting with from like military, um, mm -hmm. what is happening is that we're that we've recognized an enormous deficit and little by slowly trying to address that. All right. Mm -hmm. It's still not perfect. It's still not where it is. I, I get that. But at least it's being addressed. All right. Yeah. Um, and then when we come start coming down, then we're looking at community. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And community has a lot of resources. We have churches, we have um, support groups, we have um, neighbors, we have friends, that kind of thing. So, and then we come down to the individual. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm an, I'm an internal family systems therapist, which is mm -hmm. known as IFS. And mm -hmm. um, it's an entirely different approach. Uh, this was a um, a model that was developed by Richard Schwartz about 40 years ago, evidence-based model, and I've been using it for a long time now, <laughs> um, um, and uh, almost 10 years. Um, and I'm finding that when I work with my uh, clients who really have experienced some of them extreme trauma, so we're, we're talking you know, rape, incest, beatings, abandonment, really, you know, intense and military members as well, mm. domestic violence, you know, extreme uh, addiction, that kind of thing. Um, what IFS uh, brings to the table that's very different is that we start with that place within us that knows, right? Mm. And we get to, we get to acquainted with our pain. Mm -hmm. Well, unlike a lot of other models that say, well, just think your way out of it, you know, cognitive mm -hmm. behavioral therapy, mm -hmm. you just can think your way differently or, you know, this, that, and the other. We actually get to know, we befriend our pain. Mm -hmm. In doing that, we listen, we hear what the pain has to tell us. And then mm -hmm. remarkably, and very often, client doesn't know half of what this pain wants to say. Mm. And it comes out in the most remarkable ways, like, oh my God, I just got this thought and this insight and this connection to what's been going on. Also, a lot of times, you know, our pain is frozen. Mm -hmm. so I'm working with clients and we start going into that trauma. That trauma doesn't know that, that it's the person is no longer six years old being raped by their grandfather. Mm -hmm. It yeah. has frozen and now this individual is 40 years old. Yeah. That in and of itself is such a release to that pain, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm oversimplifying it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in essence, it's what we do in this model. And so we connect to something mm -hmm. that whatever you call it, it, you know, call it, you, you can call it anything, the universe, the divine, God, Buddha, nature, whatever you will, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, but you can connect to that and know that there is a solution, that mm -hmm. there is a release, and that there is ultimately um, an unburdening and a, and a total transformation of what that pain has been holding into joy mm -hmm. and happiness for a completely different life. Mm -hmm. And really it just dissolves that, that, that frozenness melts. Mm -hmm. if, yeah. 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 And I feel like uh, when it comes to, you know, these deep-seated traumas that people experience, I deal with clients with you know, similar situations, yeah. and I just, you know, to just assume, I would say, just from my experience, that these events won't affect their relationships or how they go about is, I find, pretty reckless because they do. They usually do in a weird, weird way that they even know it's happening. Um, they, and uh, you know the, um, and sometimes it even seems manipulative, but it's their ways of protecting themselves for so many years, decades. So sometimes I think the harder, the most notable reason I feel what you're saying holds weight for me is that you know they'll go through so many outpatient facilities, so many hospitalizations, and no one gets a correct history. No, no. one. No, no. That's and, like, I, so right. I, you and are I, so I, right. <laughs> yeah. Boy, that's that's a very good place to start right there. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? yeah, a 30 minute uh uh you know form doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. Um I spend uh almost two hours in my first session with clients. 
Mm -hmm. almost two hours and mm -hmm. i am taking a very detailed history i mean i've got questions left right and center right <laughs> and many yeah. that they haven't even ever been asked before right mm -hmm. so you're absolutely right robert i mean when we look at our side of mental health we mm -hmm. are really responsible for getting you know the information so that we can start to help right yeah 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 i feel the you know sometimes unfortunately I don't meet the client till much later because the history history wasn't really done well or effectively. So a lot of times you're like was wondering what that tangible missing piece is. And it's really just the history was of the person wasn't asked the certain questions or, um, you know, obviously there's a trust thing. There's a, there's this building that trust and getting, um, but also just asking the questions. I'm not trying to say this, but you know, when you're dealing with very sensitive cases, yeah. it does kind of frustrate you when you're saying all this time was spent not addressing anything that was really happening. So. Yeah, I think you know, and I think that um, at the end of the day, um, and I hope that that day is coming. But <laughs> uh, uh, we really need to train better, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, we're we in in some regards, we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. um, in some of our training applications or educational applications for mental health, I think we need to go back to basics. You know, start where the client is, that's number one. You start where the client is, right? Number two is ask the questions. Don't wait for the client to tell you because they're they're the one that has, you know, the pain. And that pain is going to be masked by everything's fine. No, nothing happened. No, you know, but I'm here because I'm depressed. And then you find out six months later, oh, you know, something terrible happened when you were four. Right? Yeah, yeah. Where was that? Oh, it wasn't because nobody asked the question. So yeah. I think we have a responsibility for a constant sense of curiosity. Yeah. Right? And it's what when I work with clients, I mean, I'm I repeat myself. I'm mm -hmm. curious to know. I'm <laughs> yeah. Could you yeah. tell me or could you sort of connect with that and find out? I'm curious, right? Mm. And helping clients to be curious then it gives them permission i think to answer the questions or mm. give us that information that they otherwise would never have shared so yeah. there's more compassion there as well right yeah yeah and i i think like um just 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 to just personalizing that experience with that client because if you don't it's going to be a bunch of general questions and one of the biggest complaints for clients is not being heard so they've they've been they're experts of those questionnaires that you have you know yeah, yeah. So, but exactly. now, i, I want to put a pause on that just to give us time to talk about you your your new guest i'd like to give a moment to kind of have you share what you've been up to what what drew you to this area of field not, not everyone uh goes to um to what it, is it difficult you could get there's a lot of burnout you know when it comes to this line of work yeah. so and but why do you think it matters and why do you think it matters today what we're talking about in trauma just um why do i think it matters well i think it matters i mean for me um uh this topic comes from a personal as well as a professional place mm -hmm. so i've worked in the field of addiction for almost 20 years mm -hmm. and um Every single client um, that has had an underlying trauma uh, mm. as part of the cause and condition of addictive behavior. Um, so I, I've really dedicated myself to this. Um, and it, as I said earlier, in the past 10 years, I've been working with a model of psychotherapy where the healing is visceral, it's palpable. Mm. It, it, it's really a remarkable model and mm. it, an entirely different way of looking at a human being and their internal psyche. Um, but the topic also is personal. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I am a person in long-term recovery. I'm very open about it. I have 28 mm -hmm. years uh, of freedom from alcohol, mm -hmm. uh, 41 from freedom uh, from drugs. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the need to numb uh, mm -hmm. my emotions in my life from severe trauma that I experienced uh, as a child, as a teenager and a young adult, that was the only way I knew how to cope. Mm -hmm. And so, I've walked this walk and mm -hmm. um, 
my PTSD, if you will, um, was really unburdened and in many ways healed uh, from not only IFS, but from connecting spiritually to something that was so far greater than myself, mm. but that was already within me, right? Yeah. And so why does this focus our, our awareness on PTSD matter? Well, it matters because our psychological and our spiritual well-being matters mm. to culture and the human species as a whole. Mm. Um, I think that we have, um, you know, generational trauma in this mm. country, right, mm -hmm. um, that are being carried. And mm -hmm. we have to end what see, what it, this endless cycle of yeah. this anger and rage and resentment and hatred mm. and mm. blame, right? Yeah, yeah. Because it's not getting us anywhere. All it's no. doing is, reactivating the mm -hmm. very trauma uh real or perceived that's in your system right mm -hmm. it just perpetuates into a ripple effect right? yeah so healing our traumas and breaking through to that other side where we mm -hmm. can transform individually and collectively that is where the miracles can reside. I think that's where a lot of our solutions are collectively mm. in our communities, in our broader society, but absolutely within families, within individuals, right? Mm. We can transform. We can transform. And I believe in that transformation. Yeah. And I, I also, you know, I, I think, you know, culture plays a big role. You know, we are a lot of different cultures and I'm half South Korean. So a lot of people may like when I'm working with, you know, Asian communities is very different. You know, when you think yeah. about um, the standard uh, model when it comes to whether getting help or whether, you know, whether help is even a th uh, indication of weakness or shame. Now, when it comes to um, this model, you may think, you know, one thing I would say is, you may say, "Oh, in my in my lens, this this is not a big deal." But be yeah. careful, mm -hmm. I would say, especially mm -hmm. even if you're a friend or a colleague or something, because yeah. those things do extremely matter. And yeah. Just example, yeah. In and, Korean, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, please, yeah. In Korean culture, the oldest son, you know, if you're not successful, it is one of the most shameful and oh, heavy burden for that because they're supposed to be a success absolutely no, no matter what yeah. it's not just oh i didn't make it into a university well no you have to be top marks or you put shame to the family i know this is right. these are kind of like how it is and and it's not just korean culture a lot of eastern asian cultures are like that absolutely so. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 I I I have a, a great affinity to Asian culture and um and I really understand that. Um so you know in in, in when we have a system here in, in this country that doesn't address the culture first and foremost mm -hmm. and cultural literacy of therapists and mental health providers, we're failing the client. Yeah. We're failing the client. Yeah. No question about it. Yeah. You, I just want to say, go back to you. You 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 wrote a few books, correct? And there, there's one coming out in April. I just want to show. It's called Rise in Recovery: A Spiritual Path for Healing Addiction. Thank you. Where can people find the other books if they're interested to find more? Is it in, on Amazon or? Um, well, th this will be my first book. Okay. Uh, I've written many articles. Uh, okay. And uh, along the along the these topic lines, if you okay. will. Um, okay. And you can find those articles and download them from my website, kimberly.com. Okay. Um, and the book is coming out in um, in April. Uh, and But in the interim, there will be uh, articles that will also be coming out, you know, extrapolated and or topics that are reflected in, in the material. So, yeah. Yeah. So those who are listening those who are watching in the notes there'll be li clickable links to for you to check it out obviously you can see right here that's the her website you can check out her website check out download you know i always find curiosity i know you mentioned in in our field is important but i think curiosity in general in human beings should be something desired you know if you're not really familiar i always say this with you know generational um 
I might my generation might be more accepting because we're kind of the bridge per se. But you know, be, give your give your parents a little grace. They didn't. We're brought up with all these terms. Um, trauma wasn't even really put into DSMV till '80s, so we gotta kind of give ourselves a little bit of understanding when it comes to these kind of yeah. uh, topics. So, yeah, I um, agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah, um, I just want to ask you. Um, you know, shifting. What steps have you experienced? Um, I know you mentioned this. It, it's a F, but is it, have you noticed any other things that uh, maybe we haven't mentioned, or you just or want to emphasize more when it comes to some things that was that you've seen success in when it comes to trauma, or just even with the family members understanding? Because you're, 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 it's a it's a whole whole situation when you're dealing with the clients, not just them. It's yeah. their environment. What have we seen be effective or added to what you've been doing um i think that uh the first thing is listening mm -hmm. right the first thing is listening so if we have a family member who um has had a traumatic event right um and they want to talk about it mm -hmm. right um we need to be mindful Right. We need to not get in their space and say, well, you know, tell me what happened. Tell me what happened, because that's only going to make someone turtle in. That's a, mm -hmm. a term I use to, <laughs> of just, you know, you're retreating into yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and we don't want to do that. Right. But we mm -hmm. do want to um, come from a place within ourselves where we mm -hmm. are open armed mm -hmm. and letting the other person know I'm here, mm -hmm. I'm here. I'm listening, right? And I'm not judging. Mm -hmm. I'm not judging. Whatever happened to you, it doesn't make you bad. It doesn't make you wrong. It mm -hmm. happened to you, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think for family members and friends, listening, attending, mm -hmm. right, is really, really important. Um, but we'll also, family and friends, again, you know, we have to surrender our old ideas. Mm -hmm. They, they just no longer serve us. Mm -hmm. So as difficult as it is, you know, the idea of um, having, let's say, an experience of depression, right, mm. as something that is morally wrong with us, mm. doesn't serve us. Mm. I right? have to change these ideas. It's wonderful, for instance, to uh, say, you know, I'm independent and I can overcome obstacles and challenges in my life. But when you can't get out of bed in the morning because mm. you are so, um, you know, ravaged by despair, um, that idea of independence has got to give way to, I need help and there is help out there, right? Yeah. So, you know, I think also that the collective consciousness of PTSD needs mm. to be healed. And the only way we, you know, can heal from that is to, um, is to really connect to something, again, bigger than ourselves. Yeah. Right? Bigger than the small idea of ourself, right? Yeah. And I, yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, you know, words mean different things for different people we gotta also remember that and i you know when you when you're mentioning with um you know with ptsd with ptsd and how um family members you know the old ideas of how we saw it mm -hmm. i would even venture even further the idea of what does independence mean for that individual a lot of times we don't even have that conversation a lot of times the person's there and everyone wants independence and you never talk to the, the individuals there so they're like sitting there like I, what does that independence look for that individual and um, a lot of times you know i feel i found this really interesting one of uh, um one situation was just simply the person they're like oh the person needs a place to stay you need a you know housing's always been an issue so the parents are like all trying to figure it out if he has his own place he'll feel more independent that's yeah. their perception. What what I found was that individual, when I was talking to him um, later, just said, you know, I feel miserable right now. You know, medicine, you know, medication management for some people it takes a long time. It's, it's I don't wish it on anyone, but he's like, uh, it sounds nice, you know, living somewhere else, but really, I'm just gonna be miserable somewhere else, and I feel pushed to the side. Interesting, because you know, the person 
everyone else is seeing, oh, that will make him feel independent. Maybe not yet. I like using yet at the end of the sentences yeah. because it doesn't mean it's like never going to have a place, but pushing, like you say, the turtle thing, pushing yes. a person's ideas for what you think independence will be. Words are important. What I realized, what does the individual, what is being better for that individual look like? It's, it's Precisely. A, yeah. Yeah, precisely. And again, it goes back to, you know, as therapists, as mental health providers, counselors, community workers, we have got to start where the client is. Mm -hmm. We cannot impose our judgments, opinions, and beliefs on that client. We just mm -hmm. can't. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, and, and I mean, clearly there are times when medication is appropriate. Clearly there are times when, you know, intervention is appropriate. Mm -hmm. but not, I think, again, it goes back to, I really have seen over, you know, since, well now close to 30 years since <laughs> my education began as a social worker mm -hmm. uh, and my various, you know, um, uh, experiences in the field of social work. So from clinical to community organizing and then macro policy writing, mm -hmm. writing mm -hmm. policy, you know, ultimately uh, for the, the good of society. Um, you know, we, we keep throwing the baby out with the bathwater and mm -hmm. we, we come up with this brand new idea. Oh, this will work. This is the way. And we're going to throw everything else out. Yeah. Um, I was just saying, okay, why don't we have an a la carte menu here and yeah. allow an individual to, to have a say in their own treatment? You know, not everybody wants to go into, uh, it, it, as you said, into independent living. Maybe a community living would be more appropriate mm. where there's yeah. support, right? But if we don't have the option, then how can we even give it? You know, it, it, we don't have it to give, then we're, we're really doing a disservice. So, um, yeah, so I agree with you, Robert, you really have to, um, I think we have to re-examine how our services are being delivered. But uh, again, I think we really need to pause mm. and, um, and as mental health providers, we have to start asking ourselves questions, you know, yeah. um, yeah. You know, how am I connecting with this individual? What is my belief or my opinion or my judgment about this individual? And if there is an opinion, a belief or a judgment, then I better step back and correct my side of the street before mm. I continue with the work, because all I'm doing is imposing. Right? Yes. I'm not, I'm presupposing and I'm imposing. I'm not offering solution and I'm not helping that individual to have an opportunity for their own spiritual awakening and their own spiritual growth, which is the highest hope we can have for someone, right? Yes. They'll transform from that pain, that they will heal from that pain and have joy in their life. But if we're imposing, that's not going to happen. Yeah. And I feel that the imposing a lot of times comes from a, I, I, I would say a static um, perspective where lives are not static. I know for me, I'm learning over time. <laughs> There's things that, you know, you, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, uh, one thing that I noticed is, you know, we, people like, it's good to laugh, you know, comedy. There's a re there's something about comedy that's, that kind of celebrates humanity. We are as impressive and unimpressive at the same moment. <laughs> but I think that is a good starting point, because if I were to say, I have it all figured out, I made it. Yeah. Um, you kind of put yourself in a process where you, there is a t maybe a tendency to be like of this opposing. You know, it may start out from a good place, but you're you're too concerned about how you look v versus how you are actually doing. And your clients are, you know, that's another thing. Is it more important? I say this to my clients: Is it more important to look like you're doing well versus yes. actually doing well? No. So oh, that is so true. Isn't that true? I know. Uh, and that, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, um, we're, unfortunately, you know, we're in a culture of materialism mm -hmm. that is causing in many ways, mm -hmm. um, subtle and overt traumas, particularly on our young people, right? Yeah. Particularly on our young people because exactly. it's outside, outside, outside mm -hmm. will make how do I look? How do my friends like, you know, am I thin enough? Am I pretty enough? Am I popular enough? Right. Yeah. Um, right. And then uh, unfortunately it just sucks the life force out of us. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. The pacing is very not sustainable. And honestly, if you even think of financial stability, which I'm a lot of talk with clients is 
Yeah, it's always when you make long-term goals. <laughs> when you think if you have a long-term view of your investment in yourself, yes, you usually make wiser choices at the very least. Yeah, you know, if, every, if everything's short-term, it's like Prince uh, is nineteen ninety-nine. <laughs> that's yeah. what, that, that's all it is. So you know, live life, you know, drink, and be merry. But we know a lot of times, you know, there's always that next day. So that's right. That's, that's why you know when it comes to recovery, when it comes to trauma, when it comes to I need help. It doesn't mm -hmm. really help when you think today's you know, dystopian. Today's the only day. No. It's not the only day. No. And every day can't be a crisis per that's se. Right. So that makes no, sense. No, that's right. No, we always have tomorrow. And believing that you have tomorrow, mm -hmm. um, I think for so many, um, helps that sense of despair turn mm -hmm. into a message of hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And I, I you know, I just want to ask you as we kind of wrap up, yeah. a silent healing. You know, I, I kind of thought of that when we thought of trauma because a lot of times I don't hear a lot. You hear a mm -hmm. lot when something happens. Well, let's, let's be yeah. honest. When something yeah. happens, someone has PTSD or they find out in a weird way and yeah. they're like, oh, this, you know, they didn't get the care that they need. But, mm -hmm. but it's always after the fact. It's not a lot, a lot of times when we talk about trauma. It's never when, um, oh, this person is struggling because this happened. It's done, a lot of times it's done silently. A lot of times it's just like you know, oh, you're you're still struggling. Why, why, why is why is that taking so long? Well, it takes as long as it does. You know, I try to tell people this, and I don't know. So, what do you think when you hear the words a silent healing, and why do you feel it's important? I know we talked to remember PTSD Awareness Month. We right. have all these things in them every month. Just kind of indicates how badly we forget everything <laughs> as human beings. So anything. <laughs> So. We have built-in forgetters. <laughs> right? um, so a silent healing to me um, speaks to, again, you know, how PTSD can be the disease of despair mm -hmm. and, um, and, and how unnecessary that really should be, right? Mm -hmm. it, that it shouldn't be that. It should be that um, the meaning of a silent healing should mean that there is an awakening that yeah. there's you know there's growth but yeah. it, uh, it unfortunately because of the way we we deal with ptsd and trauma it doesn't end up being that way so it does become this turtling in this pain and you know an unspeakable kind of or unspoken mm -hmm. uh, uh, persistent uh, disease if you will so um and that's dis-ease as mm -hmm. well disease right because we're yeah. not we're not comfortable in our body we're not comfortable with our thoughts or emotions or feelings um so you know i think that ptsd awareness month uh, i think it should be ptsd awareness period right exactly yeah but it really should be thought of as a new beginning yeah if someone comes and and we have an opportunity to help right mm -hmm. to facilitate the healing um, this is a new path for healing individuals and our community and our society as a whole. Mm. And I think that PTSD Awareness Month should be remembered as an opportunity for spiritual awakening, mm. spiritual growth, because mm. we, we can go into that darkness and we can find the light. Yeah. That portal of pain can open up and it can become a portal of renewal. Mm hmm and I, I believe that in my heart and soul and I you know and this is why I've dedicated myself to working in this field mm -hmm. um, because unless we look through that lens mm -hmm. we're never actually going to be able to give anybody an opportunity to heal right? I, I want to just ask you one last um, as we you're at, before your final thoughts how would you like this year to be remembered PTSD month. I know it's it's something that we want to. It's important. You think it's worth remembering. The month maybe should be taken out. Just remember. <laughs> but, but like, how okay. would how would you well, this year? You know, obviously there's some things that are different this year. You know, we're getting out. I know we're kind of always sort of getting out of COVID. Things have yeah. changed in society of how. You know, uh, I just what would you like people to remember this year when it comes to PTSD month? Um, I think that, that this year, um, I think we need to remember that individually and collectively, we have come out of three years of trauma. Yeah. No doubt. 
and we we are coming out of it right mm -hmm. we haven't yet left it behind mm -hmm. but that you know ptsd is not necessarily overt it can be very subtle mm -hmm. and i think if we are more gentle with each other in mm -hmm. recognizing that as we look behind us it has been three years of mm -hmm. intense day in day out trauma mm -hmm. So many different levels. Mm. And that none of us have been left unscathed. Not mm -hmm. one. Not one of us. So, you know, uh, to remember this year that PTSD isn't them, mm -hmm. right? It's us. Yeah. And when we include ourselves in that equation, I think mm. we have an opportunity for a better solution. Yeah. Um, I really do. So that's how I hope people will remember it, um, is that we're coming out of, we're not completely, you know, <laughs> of, we are coming out of something that was so devastating, was so shocking, was so horrifying. And that each one of us, whether we have a diagnosis or not, mm. are carrying those scars, are carrying those fissures, if you will. Mm. Um, and I think that's why it's really important for us to have a lot more compassion for our fellow man. No. And, I, and I, I, I agree with that. Any, any last little final thoughts as we wrap up? This up? Um, thank you. Yeah. A couple. I, yeah. Um, I always think that random acts of kindness, mm -hmm. um, they're random. Mm -hmm. right? So um, I always encourage uh, my friends, my family, and my clients make a commitment to engage in deliberate acts of compassion mm -hmm. every day, every mm -hmm. day. And be grateful for everything that you do have because you have a lot if you just mm -hmm. stop and look around. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other uh, adage that I have is thank everyone around mm -hmm. you because they mm -hmm. are your teachers mm -hmm. and they're your guides, your mentors. Mm -hmm. Even those people who you think you hate, Right, your enemies, they are the most important teachers of all. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But last and most important is to love yourself and to love each other. Right. Mm -hmm. Because really connecting to that divine love, right? That mm -hmm. universal love consciousness, that that open heartedness, mm -hmm. that's where we find relief. That's where we find an end to our suffering. So that would be my final words for today. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your thoughts with us today. I want to say um, to stay updated with Revive Ministries through various platforms. Revive Ministries FL.com is our website. This is goodbye from Revive Ministries Podcast. Leaving with his last quote is from Del Alanubi. I hope I said that correctly. It says, wounds won't heal the way you want them to. They'll heal the way they need to. Beautiful. Thank you.